Best ever listeners, welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Ash Patel, and I'm with today's guest, Mark Weissy. Mark is joining us from Jersey City, New Jersey. He is the principal at Maple Capital Partners, which invests in multifamily and class B and C neighborhoods throughout the U.S. Mark's portfolio consists of being a GP on four properties and an LP on four properties. Mark, thank you for joining us, and how are you today? Doing really well. Thanks for having me, Ash. This is such a blessing. Oh, it's our pleasure, man. Mark, before we get started, can you give the best ever listeners a little bit more about your background and what you're focused on now? Absolutely. So I come from the world of finance. Uh, I've worked my entire career in financial markets, uh, first on the IT side of things, and then in the last, say, seven years or so in trading and portfolio management. Um, and over the last five or six years, I've uh, steadily grown my own uh, personal portfolio and then transitioned into the multifamily space with my partner and I. Mark, the million dollar question, what are stocks going to do going forward? We're recording this mid-August of 22. What's your gut <laughs> feeling? We're not going to hold you to it and we're not going to circle back. You know, I'm, I'm my crystal balls in the shop is what I always say. Uh, I am not a stock guy, uh, full disclosure. I trade uh, bonds, municipal bonds, which are a little bit less volatile uh, than stocks. And I'm actually pretty happy about that. So um, I couldn't tell you uh, as far as the economy, I think that uh, potentially we could have a, a, a slowdown here um, as we're already experiencing. And uh, hopefully it's a soft landing as opposed to a hard landing, which uh, the Fed is trying to engineer here. Yeah, Mark, you don't often see finance people crossing over into real estate. How did you get exposed to real estate? Yeah, so I'll start at the beginning where my father uh, came to this country in the 80s as an immigrant from the Middle East and uh, kind of a typical immigrant story, you know, came here with nothing in his pocket and, and made a life for himself and, and our family. And so uh, ownership and having, you know, entrepreneurship in my family was always a, a pretty seminal part of my childhood. And so, you know, I always had in the back of my head having ownership over whether it be a business or real estate. Then I came across the uh, little purple Bible, as I call it, the Robert Kiyosaki, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad book. And uh, I was hooked on, on real estate ever since then. What was your first property? I had bought a condo in Jersey City uh, initially just to live in and then started to do a house hack. This was back in 2017, before I think some of the terminology around house hacking was maybe around or at least in the forefront. And I was just basically thinking that I rent out a couple of rooms and help you know, pay a portion of my mortgage every month. And it kind of snowballed from there. What was that pivotal moment that made you passionate about real estate? Yeah, I think it was the fact of just seeing in, in my area at that time, uh, equity values were going up pretty rapidly. And, you know, what I was making at work relative to what I was making by just owning property there, as well as the cash flow itself, that was a, really an eye opener for me. Do you still work full time? I do still work full time. Yep. And what was your first multifamily property? Yes. Yeah, so we started off in residential, as I mentioned, buying condos and then single family and then duplexes uh, in the northern New Jersey area. So, you know, technically it was a duplex. Uh, as far as the larger stuff, it was a 32 unit was uh, the first commercial property that we bought uh, out of state, actually. Who's we? Myself and my partner. Uh, we met initially back in 2018 or so. He was another local real estate investor, uh, came from actually the same alma mater as myself, but I didn't know him in college. So just kind of a funny uh, past there that uh, we, we had. And he had, came from the world of civil engineering. And so myself with my finance background and him with more of the construction had and you know managing large projects, it just seemed to be a good partnership there. And we started off very small um, on that duplex uh, that I mentioned. And you know we were there after work every day putting in the hours, sometimes working late into the night or early morning. And we saw that we were working you know, very hard and we're working very well together. And uh, that kind of started the, the partnership in earnest from there. Mark, with your partner, did you have the property first or did you decide to build this company and then go out and find the property? We decided to build a company first. We both uh, initially meeting, uh, upon initially meeting, we both figured out that we had the same goals uh, in his case, he had a, a young uh, family, you know, two little children that he was looking to build a legacy for. 
And for me, I was looking to build up some passive income every month. And so we were both in line, aligned in terms of that. And we decided to start off small and take it from there. And who found the 32 unit property? We both did jointly. We were in a mentorship program with a mentor who's still a really good friend of ours, who actually, funnily enough, was looking to sell a few of his properties in his target market, which was very close to our target market. And so we decided to take a look and asked him if it would be all right to make an offer on one of those properties. And it ended up working out. What were the numbers on that 32 unit? Absolutely. So we bought it uh, just below $2.5 million. So it was about uh, 70-ish a door, 72-ish a door, I believe it was. Um, and they're townhomes. They're located in Louisville, Kentucky, which is now our target market. Um, and we bought that in September of last year. And for basically the last 11 months, I've been undergoing our, our value-add business plan. And what is that value-add business plan? Is it full renovations for each unit? Yeah, so we started kind of with an outside-in approach where we were improving some of the curb appeal, improving some of the exterior. Uh, and then as units would turn over, we would basically give tenants, if, if they had a good you know, history with the property and, and with us, uh, we would give them an option of, hey, would you like to stay here? Potentially, we'll add some improvements to the interior of your property. Um, you'll pay a little bit higher rent. Uh, or you know, if you'd like to part ways, um, then you know, we'll go in and do a full renovation. Um, wasn't a gut renovation, but, um, you know, select improvements there. Um, I think our improvement budget was around 8,000 a door is what we're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, steadily kind of renovating these units and attracting, uh, you know, higher rents. What does 8,000 a unit buy you these days? I know prices have skyrocketed. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're doing LVP finishes on the flooring. Uh, we're doing new paint. We're doing vanities in the bathrooms if needed. Uh, we're doing potentially new lighting packages. These units, since they're townhomes, they do have decks on the uh, backs of the units. So potentially some improvements there. Um, and then select other improvements um, to both the interior and exterior. Um, as uh, you know, one of, one of the exterior items that we really wanted to add upon doing our due diligence and driving by the property at various times of day and night, we realized that it wasn't very well lit. And so adding lighting to both the exterior of the building itself as well as the nearby light post to make it feel a little bit safer and more homey at night. Yeah, that's a huge deal. One of the first things I recommend to anybody buying any commercial building, improve the lighting. Makes a huge difference. And just people in that area or people that drive by realize there's new life in this building, right? $2.5 million purchase. Did you also raise for CapEx? We did. We raised the entire CapEx uh, budget. Uh, we ended up going with agency debt, uh, the Freddie SBL program. And so we raised all the CapEx budget as well as uh, closing costs and acquisition fees. So what was the total raise? Yeah, it was about 1.1 million. Is this the first time you and your partner raise money? No, we've raised for other operators, uh, kind of co-sponsoring on other deals before, um, particularly with uh, mentors of ours where we've come on, help them raise some capital, as well as serve in some other capacities. And kind of it served as our training wheels in terms of getting our feet wet in this space. Um, we felt that that was the best approach for us, going from much smaller units to you know, much larger properties. If we could kind of have the comfort and the experience level of more senior operators than ourselves, that we could learn much faster and get off you know, without any hiccups. Yeah, I like that approach. Mark, what's easier, raising for your own deals or raising for other people's deals? That's a great question. Um, I think when it comes down to it, you have to believe in a deal regardless of whether or not it's your deal or somebody else's. So whenever we're raising on a deal, whether it's another sponsor's deal as a lead sponsor or it's ours, we always do. We always look at the deal and do our own due diligence as if it's, it is our deal, in fact. So I would say that we don't treat the deals any differently. Um, in fact, we're always co-investing alongside our LPs on any deal that we do because we feel that skin in the game is absolutely necessary to demonstrate that we are uh, have commitment to the deal. Your investment in these deals, is it reinvesting fees or is it actually cash from your bank account going into the deal? Yeah, great distinction. Uh, it's always cash from our bank account uh, going into the deal. I feel that that's even even higher level of uh, commitment to the deal as opposed to money, which may not have ever been in your possession uh, in the first place. I love it. 
um, great answers, great approach. Um, and cause, but, you know, I've, uh, I had an investment club where we evaluated startup businesses and I didn't care who invested, who didn't, but everyone always asked, Hey, are you putting money into it? And that's very important, right? People need to know that if you're behind something that you've, you've got skin in the game beyond, like you said, the money that was never in your possession. I love how you put that. Awesome. Uh, how much money did you guys raise for other people's deals before this 1.1? Yeah, great question. So we raised, I think, initially around two hundred fifty thousand on our first deal, um, and then three hundred thousand, and it kind of grew from there. Um, so starting off with maybe a handful of investors on our first raise, and then as we've kind of made it more known within our network, and as our network has steadily grown, we've kind of grown our our investor base there with each subsequent deal. Yeah, and that's uh, you're on the fast track to success. Mark, how do you acquire new investors? Yeah, great question. Um, so one of the things that we're working on now is revamping our website. Um, we want to put out a lot more content in terms of on, on the educational side. Uh, tons of folks from you know our networks, maybe they have some fundamental understanding of real estate, but they're a little bit leery of this whole syndication word and how it all works. So you know, educating is first and foremost how we kind of see ourselves. Um, you know, I, I've read the Hunter Thompson book, which there's a line in there, which I absolutely love. It's always be disclosing. Uh, and I kind of took that as, you know, whereas in the, in the 80s and movies like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross kind of popularized this idea of always be closing. Um, I don't consider myself a salesperson. I consider myself first and foremost an educator. So whether we meet somebody on a webinar or in person, or it's a friend of a friend who maybe, you know, had heard what we're doing and what we're up to and wanted to learn more. It's always a matter of, you know, hopping on the phone or meeting in person and making them comfortable with the risks and kind of rewards of this investment class. Okay. Uh, I love that. Again, if I don't know anything about real estate and I agree to having a lunch with you to find out more, let's play through how that conversation evolves. So uh, you start, man, Hey, tell me what you're doing. Tell me this real estate thing and why is it good for me? Absolutely. So First and foremost, I actually will flip the script a little bit. I always try to learn about them um, because, you know, what, as much as I live in the real estate world every day and believe in this asset class, and I, I really think that there's no better investment opportunity out there, um, it's not perfect for everybody. Um, you know, real estate is, is a great tool uh, for wealth building over time, but there are some people that it might not be suitable for. So I always try to understand what their background is, uh, whether they've invested before, whether it be real estate, stocks, bonds, any kind of. Uh, asset class, and then what their goals are. Um, it has to really align with what individuals' goals are. Um, it is by no means a get-rich-quick scheme, uh, despite what you might see on social media and things like that. So I'm always trying to, you know, set expectations that this is really a long-term investment, and that liquidity is, you know, going to be, um, you know, not there for maybe the first two, three, potentially five years on the deals that we're doing. Um, and if it makes sense for them at that point, then I'll talk a little bit further about what we're up to. Mark, that's a killer mindset. I love that. With your partner, how many deals have you done? Yeah, so as lead GPs, we've done two deals. We're currently working on our third deal, uh, which we're doing inspections for this week. What's uh, something you would change about the dynamics of you and your partner working together? Um, I don't know that I would change anything other than the fact that I would have partnered up earlier. Um, I had been investing for a couple of years on my own and kind of I guess the the rookie real estate, a quintessential rookie real estate mistake was thinking I had to do it all myself and figuring out over time that, you know, there's there's more than enough uh, in terms of roles and equity to go around. And so giving some of that up um, uh, in exchange for somebody else's expertise, because I'm, I'm not great at everything. Uh, the things that I am great at, my kind of superpowers, I prefer to focus on those things and basically partner with others that can fill in the other gaps. What are your superpowers and what are the things you need to offload? I feel that one of my uh, superpowers is my background in financial markets and financial modeling. And so I kind of say it as, uh, and I, I stole this from a friend, I'm a freak in the sheets. I, I love spreadsheets. I love Excel. I spend most of my day in Excel, doing underwriting, looking at markets, uh, analyzing deals. And so I serve as kind of the, the chief underwriter on our team and do a lot of the acquisitions work on that end. 
um, as well as a lot of the capital raising, speaking to investors. Uh, and then my partner, he fills the gap in terms of drafting the scope for CapEx, talking to contractors, doing a lot of the asset management, essentially. A freak in the sheets, man. I was wondering where that was going. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a good uh, showstopper line. Um, Mark, what's next for you? Yeah, so we're excited to get this deal closed here in the coming month or so. Um, and it'll be another opportunity for us to kind of scale our operations. This is bigger, the biggest deal that we've done thus far. Uh, There's going to be 49 units. And so looking forward to closing that and continuing to, you know, undergo our business uh, growth here with this deal and continuing to learn along the way. Just, you know, part of this whole journey is just continuously learning. And I know in speaking to other more experienced operators, it's something that seems to be a commonality amongst people that are really successful in this space is they're super hungry to learn, never think that they know enough. And um, I think in the current environment that we're going to undergo, I think it's going to be the people that are the most creative and the most willing to do what others aren't uh, in terms of adding value to properties. I think those are the people that are going to get the most deals in our contract and, and you know, do, do the most in terms of business over the next couple of years here. I tend to agree with you, Mark. I want to dive into more numbers on this deal and uh, finish detailing the 32 unit deal as well. You've achieved a lot of success since 2017. And before we get into the numbers, um, I want to ask, what's the hardest lesson you've learned and something you can share that the best ever listeners can really learn from as well? What's the toughest lesson that you've learned in real estate? Yeah, our path has been anything but linear. We've definitely had a bunch of ups and downs. It's, it's been a roller coaster of emotions at times. Um, so I would say taking action every day and then being comfortable with uncertainty and kind of course correcting along the way. So you can't control what's going to happen. You know, there are going to be tons of things that happen that are outside your control that you're just going to have to roll with the punches and adapt and pivot to. Um, but it's just important that you, you know, get comfortable with the idea that you're never going to have all the information. And I think with my background being super analytical, that was something that I had to get over was, you know, the fact that these are properties, these are living, breathing things that you're just going to have to be comfortable with, you know, knowing maybe 70, 80% of the story with and moving forward. And for the remaining 10 to 20%, 30%, you're going to have to course correct along the way and having the right team in place to be able to do that. All right. That's a great 50,000 foot answer. But what is the worst thing that's happened to you that's been out of your control? Yeah, so I would say one of the early deals that we did was actually as an LP. Um, this is a little bit of a, a different lesson that I learned from the previous one I just outlined. It was really the fact that uh, it's imperative that you as an LP vet the sponsors, uh, vet their morals and their ethical compass. Um, because you know there's an age old saying in syndication that you bet on the jockey and not the horse. And I think that couldn't be more true. Uh, you know, you can have the best deal on paper that there is, but it comes down to the individual that's actually running the deal and whether or not they're going to do the right thing when, you know, things go awry or, or no one's looking. And so I would say, you know, take your time. If you're looking to invest passively, get to know that individual, get to know what makes them tick uh, and, you know, maybe follow them for a few deals before you ever decide to invest a penny uh, in, in a deal with them. The way we get successful is by accumulating a lot of scars, right? What's a deal that scarred you or an incident that scarred you or something you lost money on? Yeah, so that's kind of that story that I just outlined was uh, we invested with a group uh, that, you know, was basically pursuing an Airbnb strategy um, here in the Northeast. And this was back in 2018. So we didn't know a ton about investing passively. We didn't know which questions to ask or which red flags to look for necessarily. So we invested with them, put our full faith in them. Um, about two years into the deal, we saw that things were going sideways. Uh, we weren't meeting our, our, our budget and you know, a number of things that they said were gonna be done weren't being done. And uh, there just wasn't a great level of communication. And so uh, we ended up having to get involved and roll up our sleeves, myself and my partner, and actually stabilized that asset um, in the last few years here. Um, and so, you know, that definitely left a mark in the back of my mind was that, you know, when you're looking at deals, really, like I said, vet the sponsor, um, because I, I wouldn't wish that experience on anybody. Um, but it was also a kind of an epiphany for us was that, you know, we can do this. Uh, the fact that we had to come in 
uh, after the fact and clean things up. It was kind of proof and built confidence in us that we could do this. Um, and so it gave us the confidence to be able to offer opportunities that, of our own to investors going forward um, with the idea that we never wanted anybody to be in our shoes uh, like we were a few years back. Yeah, that's crazy. So as LPs, you guys had to become active in the investment. Correct. All right. Um, I want to dive into that maybe in a following episode, because that sounds like something that we can learn from and do a whole episode deep dive on. We'll come back to that one. All right, man, let's get in. Let, let's finish up the 32 unit deal. Um, I'm assuming it's class C or class B. Yeah, it was class C upon takeover. It was in a strong class B neighborhood. And the goal is to make it class B, not class A. Correct. Yeah, it's surrounded by a number of properties that were kind of proof of concept for us. Um, they were similar vintage properties that had undergone some capex in the last few years and were getting kind of the target rents that we wanted to get towards uh, achieving. And so that was kind of our uh, you know, proof of concept. Okay. And how long is the hold? Yeah, so we're targeting a five-year hold. Uh, with our deals, we always try to match up the uh, life uh, horizon of the of the deal with the debt that we're securing. So in this case, we have seven-year debt. It's a five-year hold. So should things deteriorate in the coming years, we have a few years to kind of figure things out. Is that debt assumable? It is. Okay. And return projected return to investors? On that deal, it was around uh, 14 and a half IRR over five years. Uh, an eight and a half percent cash on cash. And I believe it was close to a, if not over a two X multiple. Got it. And the new deal that you're working on 49 units, what's the purchase price? Yeah. So this was a $3.55 million purchase price. I wanted a contract on. In Louisville as well. Correct. What's the raise on it? Uh, so it is a lower leverage loan that we're actually assuming. So being that it's lower leverage, it's around 57 LTV. So we're raising about two and a quarter million, which when you compare that to the purchase price may seem a little bit higher than maybe other deals that uh, past investors have seen. Um, but it, the reason being that it's, it's low leverage. Low leverage, you're borrowing more than 50%. Well, how's that low leverage? It's 57%. Uh, we were quoted uh, on new debt around 70% uh, LTV that we could uh, get. So relative to what we would get on new debt, it is lower leverage. Oh, sorry. Okay, I get that. I was flipping it. Um, okay, and the return to investors on this one? Yeah, so we're targeting between 13 and 15% IRR, around 6 to 8% cash on cash, and again, around that 1.8 to 2.1x multiple over five years. Is there a PREF being paid on this? Yes, we're putting in place a six PREF. And when does that start getting paid? That starts uh, six months into the deal. Um, we want to be able to have enough cushion to kind of stabilize uh, things with the, our operations on the, on the property side and then start paying that out in month six. Got it. Awesome, Mark. Are you ready for the best ever lightning round? I am. All right, Mark, what is your best real estate investing advice ever? Yeah, I think it's surrounding yourself by other people that are doing it at a higher level. So the acronym that I always use is PAP. Uh, and I kind of equate that to the first P is peers. So, you know, whether it's a mastermind or just an investment club that you surround yourself with, other people that are a similar level or maybe a little bit ahead of you, behind you, that you can learn from and in turn teach one day. Um, that's, that's one aspect of it. A, kind of advisors. Uh, so you can call that a mentor or a coach. Um, anybody that's a little bit further ahead of you that can help you avoid some costly mistakes. I think, um, you know, a lot of times there are paid programs, which I think that money is, is well spent for a lot of programs um, because it'll help you avoid a lot of time, frustration, stress, and potentially dollars in mistakes that you make along the way. And then the last P is partners. So partnering with people, uh, like I mentioned, that maybe have complementary skill sets as you that have aligned values, kind of live with the same value set that you have same belief system that you have um, that you can partner with and, and you can all kind of share the load uh, because as I mentioned, there is more than enough to, to, in terms of responsibilities to go around. Mark, what's the best ever book you read recently? I am currently reading 75 Hard by Andy Frisella. It's a, really a program more so than a book um, that it's, it's kind of a routine that you follow every day for 75 days straight. Uh, and it kind of instills 
commitment and, and mental toughness. It's the book is about discipline in, in a sense. Mark, what's the best ever way you like to give back? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I've been very lucky in my life. Uh, number one, being born in America. Uh, number two, being born into a, a family uh, that was very loving, very supportive, um, instilled some, some great values. So um, I try to give back in, in terms of mentoring. I mentor a child here in northern New Jersey, um, and I've been doing so for the last five years. And uh, it's been tremendously gratifying seeing him grow and, and learn and develop his own interests and passions and also incorporating him in what I'm doing um, on the entrepreneurship side. I think, you know, there's a ton to be gained from public schools, but unfortunately, I think one of the things that may be lacking is just this sense of ownership and, and you know, entrepreneurial uh, pursuit. Yeah, I went to one of the best undergrad business schools out there and didn't really learn that either. Uh, so I agree with you. Mark, What's uh, how can the best ever listeners reach out to you? Absolutely. So you can feel free to reach out to me via email at mark, it's M-A-R-C, at investwithmaple.com. That's investwithmaple.com. Feel free to call me or text me at my phone number, 908-319-4351. Or you could find me on socials. My name is M-A-R-C. My last name is W-E-I-S-I. -I. I'm on IG and Facebook primarily. Awesome, Mark. Thank you for your time today. Your background in finance, trading, and finding real estate after reading that book, uh, starting out with single families, going to condos, and now heading up to 49 units. Congratulations on your success, and thank you for sharing your story with us. Thanks for having me, Ash. Best ever listeners, thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review. Share this podcast with someone you think can benefit from it. And also follow, subscribe, and have a best every day.